blue.
All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the monthly Oklahoma Department of Commerce call. Jennifer Springer, Director of Business Development. Before we get started, uh, just a reminder to have everybody stay on mute. And if you have any questions uh, about with, for any of the speakers, put them in the uh, chat box and we'll get to those towards the end of the call. Uh, for our agenda today, uh, I will provide you guys an update for the business development team. We'll hear opening remarks from Director Kissling. Then we'll see a presentation uh, by Don Morris on workforce, and then hear from General Wright on the legislative process and community development. Uh, Director Marshall Votes will uh, update us. So for business development, uh, first, the closeout of last year, uh, the Commerce Business Team reported historically high results. Our team achieved the investment and jobs goals set by Secretary Mueller, reporting 64 wins, 7,849 jobs created by companies that we worked with, and $2 billion in new investment into the state. But a deeper dive in looking at some of the trends of our data by sector, the automotive projects uh, wins accounted for 13%. And on our aerospace side, 17% of our wins uh, were from the aerospace industry. And so that shows uh, first, uh, we always uh, have a robust uh, aerospace uh, year, but uh, automotive is definitely catching up. And uh, we have, I believe, 19 open automotive projects currently uh, being worked at Department of Commerce. In regard to foreign direct investment, about 16% of our wins came from international companies uh, that came to Oklahoma, invested in Oklahoma. 9% uh, of our wins uh, were companies that we recruited out of California. And if you recall earlier, Commerce had deployed a marketing campaign uh, to directly recruit businesses from California uh, to the state of Oklahoma. And then if you look at the geography of the winds in our state, 48% of our projects located in rural communities around uh, the state, and that attributed to 3,498 uh, new jobs. And so that is historically high, 48%, um, it usually runs in the, the lower 30s. Uh, last year, our deal flow, we had 313 projects uh, come in over the course of a year, uh, and we average about 170. So uh, that was, uh, it was historically high for us as we saw some of the slack coming out of the COVID uh, pent up demand. <coughs> so this year for business development, we have focused on four main initiatives uh, for the business development team with the goal of improving the economy, increasing Oklahomans wages, and expanding businesses. And so our first priority is infrastructure and site development. So working with our communities to develop and catalog industrial sites around the state so that we're meeting the trends of the types of companies uh, and projects that are looking uh, to Oklahoma. Currently, we have an EDA grant um, that was a million dollars that Department of Commerce applied for on the business team. This is to subgrant out to communities uh, to allow them uh, to evaluate their sites for capacity and types of industry. And so we'll be making a, uh, uh, releasing a press release um, here today or tomorrow, uh, but we were able to award 28 communities around the state. Our second largest priority, our large priority is lead generation and pipeline. So making sure that we uh, continue to build back our pipeline as these projects uh, work through and come out. The secretary set a very ambitious goal of 8,000 new jobs and $1.5 billion in new investment for 2022. And so we're excited to work towards achieving that. Our third initiative is the Oklahoma Supply Chain Initiative. And we work with our partners at Oklahoma Manufacturing Alliance on this. And the purpose of this, uh, it was launched during the pandemic, but it's to mitigate supply chain issues and build and depict robust clusters around the state to, to aid recruitment. And so uh, Oklahoma Manufacturing Alliance is on here. We'll talk with them later, uh, but the Connects platform has over 400 manufacturers from around the state. And we've got some really great updates about that later on. 
Lastly, talent recruitment with historically low unemployment rate, focus on talent recruitment and upskilling our workers. Uh, and we'll hear a little bit about this later on. So those are our priorities on the business development team for 2022. We have a very robust pipeline. We have 89 open projects currently on the business development team. Uh, and so we are looking forward to recruiting new businesses and working through our project pipeline. So with that, I'll go over to Director Kisling for opening remarks. Oh, <clears throat> all right, good afternoon, everybody. I hope that you're staying nice and warm and uh, uh, I am actually in Enid today. It is snowing big time and we'll be heading it, uh, shoving it off to the rest of the state soon, I think. Um, I am filling in today for Secretary Mueller, who we have had on the road 21 of the last 23 days doing some business recruiting. We've got him in Europe right now, and so he, is, uh, he has been earning his keep, that's for sure, lately. Uh, but we have uh, a lot of things that we want to try to cover for you. Uh, I wanted to just make you aware that uh, coming up on this Monday is going to be whenever our legislative session starts, and at noon will be the State of the State Address. Uh, you may want to dial in on that. Uh, the, the four main things I believe the governor will be talking about is uh, strategies on infrastructure, on education, on health care, and on the economy. And so, of course, we have been very involved in the, uh, in the language uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the economy section of the speech, but also that part of the legislative agenda uh, for this next year. And, uh, and I just want to commend all of you. I know uh, we have some business folks on here, but uh, a lot of the, the folks on this call today are local economic developers and, and nonprofit leaders. And, um, and what you're doing in your communities is working. Uh, one thing that we do every day is, is look at our numbers and see where the economy is heading. And the numbers look great right now. Things like 2.3% unemployment rate, that is third in the nation which means we are still, our, our businesses in Oklahoma are still doing a better job of keeping our citizens employed than 47 other states are. Uh, so that's outstanding. It also means we don't have a lot of people that are just sitting on the couch and collecting a check. We've, we've gotten folks off the bench and, and, uh, and into the workforce. So you're doing very well there. Uh, and of course we have more people in the labor force in Oklahoma, over 1.8 million right now. Uh, that's more than we have ever had working in the state. And it, uh, we've been looking at the breakdown on that there. We've had uh, pretty significant increases in self-employment lately in Oklahoma. A lot of new businesses starting. Again, it's a testament to uh, the work that, that all of you are doing. Labor force participation rate is back to above uh, pre-COVID numbers. Um, but, uh, the, but the number I love to look at, and if you're, if you're really doing things right in your state, it means people want to come and be a part of it. And the uh, U.S. Census Bureau just released their census estimates as uh, uh, from April 1st, 2020. So basically the beginning of the pandemic to today. And Oklahoma is 11th in the nation in net migration into our state. It's 11th in the nation. It's about 27,000 new people have moved here in the last 18 months. Uh, whereas as a point of reference from 2010 to 2020, our total population increase was 200,000. And that made us the fastest growing in our whole region, except for Texas. Uh, so that is definitely continuing. We are uh, um, getting it out of the ballpark. Just kind of a FYI, the, the top states for domestic uh, in migration are Florida, Texas, Arizona, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, Idaho, Utah, Nevada. And then Oklahoma comes in at 11th. And then those that have the biggest net out migration, those that are losing population and losing it very rapidly, uh, number one by a long ways is California. Uh, they've lost, lost 429,000 people just in the last 18 months. Uh, New York has lost over 400,000 people. Illinois has lost over 150,000 people. Massachusetts, New Jersey, uh, you kind of see some trends there. But uh, um, anyway, the numbers are looking really good for us. Two other quick things. Uh, we have worked, we're, we're trying hard to get more folks interested in becoming an economic development professional someday. And uh, one small thing that we are doing to try to promote that is we're creating a new commerce college internship program. Uh, we will be hiring three interns this summer. 
um, one from OU, one from OSU, and one from any other college in the state. And they'll be rotating among our different divisions. Um, those applications are live as of today. I believe, uh, Amy, they're on our website if anybody is interested. Uh, but uh, love to, to find some college students that would be interested in that. And then the other thing that I will mention, hope I don't steal somebody else's thunder, but um, in April, we're going to be doing our Oklahoma Innovation Expansion Program again. We call these our innovation grants. They're, uh, in essence, $150,000 grants for manufacturers looking to create a new product, the revenue stream. It wouldn't have to be a manufacturer, but it does tend to work well, best with manufacturing programs. This is something we started during the pandemic, and we've done it every year since then. Uh, but April 4th is our date that those applications will open up and they'll only be open for a couple of weeks and hope to do about $10 million worth of those. That is what I've got today. Um, what I'd like to do now is turn the program over to Don Morris. Don is our state workforce director. And, and one of the top questions that we're getting right now, and many of you are as well, is uh, what kind of programs are available to our businesses and our communities to, to help connect people with uh, with businesses and find resumes. Don is the resident expert on that. And I will turn the floor over to him. All right, thank you, Brent. And for the record in Oklahoma City, the storm hasn't lived up to the hype yet. So uh, not, not one snowflake yet where I live. So uh, thank you everyone for letting me join in. I hope I've got some things that'll, that'll update you on what, what's going on for 2022 and let you know about some of the services that we also have available. Let me uh, share my screen here quickly. All right, can everyone see my screen? Sounds good, all right, head nods are good. Um, I've got a lot of information in this <clears throat> slide deck, just a, a few slides, but most of that I'm gonna pass on to you. And so I'm gonna zip through this in the way of an update, but hopefully also provide some information that you can use later or, or uh, uh, reach out and, and I can answer any questions later. I always put up a reminder that Oklahoma Works is about connecting business, community, and education. Uh, to drive our workforce and not just drive, but thrive uh, our economy and, and our state as well. And so by way of update on this slide, this, this indicates the workforce centers that we have around the state, but there's 28 on this map. And if you look very closely in the Northeast, there's a couple of other uh, smaller type workforce centers in this graphic. To point out uh, what was once the Tulsa Workforce Board and the Eastern Workforce Board have been combined in the last year to form Green Country. And so Green Country Workforce Investment Board is the combination of those 11 counties and we're doing a lot of work to, uh, to make them successful and they are doing great work to, to uh, make that end as well. And so that's, that's probably one of the biggest change. Oklahoma now has six workforce areas. Um, as I talk about workforce and what we do, uh, for different entities, it's important that, that we know that Oklahoma Office of Workforce Development, uh, we don't operate in a vacuum, right? So these partner services uh, with CareerTech, um, OESC and DRS, we really are core partners under the same grant, uh, the WIOA Act grant, uh, and we function together. So some of the things that you see me list as, as uh, benefits to you and to our job seekers, uh, involve all, all four, one or all four of these uh, entities as well. Um, at the state level, we, um, we, we our essential duty is to staff the Governor's Council for Workforce and Economic Development. And so we carry that out. I list sector partnership strategies here. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those in the past or in the future. <laughs> but uh, as by way of definition, a sector partnership is a partnership of business leaders uh, from the same industry in a, in a shared labor market uh, region who work with education, workforce development, economic development, and community organizations to address the workforce and other competitiveness needs of their industry. It's an opportunity for businesses who often compete uh, to lay aside some differences and focus on the bigger picture of developing talent pipelines in certain skill sets and in certain industries and geographies to work together and, and build a long-term future pipeline of talent uh, versus the, the short-term game of just uh, recruiting people from each other, if that makes sense. It moves us to a, 
a better supply of labor throughout the state. And so uh, I'll, I'll uh, show you kind of what we spend in that. It's our job to find more grant dollars. Uh, we, we are the uh, grantor to the local workforce boards. And so we monitor and oversee uh, the funding there. Um, we work with the other 17 partner agencies and some of the stuff you probably have seen that, that uh, we do. And I'll talk about some uh, state level uh, initiatives as well. For the job seeker, it's, it's important when we talk about workforce to talk about two sides of the same coin. Uh, a person needs a job and a workplace needs a person, qualified person. And so workforce services make those two things uh, happen and meet in the middle. A big part of that, uh, in addition to education needed uh, for people to get the skill set they need, is the removal of barriers. And so we have a lot of programs designed to just facilitate uh, moving from wherever a person is in life uh, to that employee that, that you need and to that career that they want. And so these are some of our programs you can see listed through here, um, various other agencies as well. The most important thing in this slide is that, that our workforce centers, uh, any way you reach out to us, we, we connect people to uh, other benefits as well. And so when you, when you engage with us, um, things like TANF and SNAP and our partners at DHS and uh, all of our partners together, we will help a person get to those benefits as well. Our job is to remove all the barriers and, and get you to work. Uh, very proud of the work that we do around veteran services, disability, and uh, other supportive services that we do. For businesses and employers, I uh, mentioned sector partnerships again. Um, this year, we have five of these functioning on individual grants uh, that were provided and approved through the Governor's Council, uh, making a difference in areas like uh, CDL drivers, which is the most open job in the state right now. Um, uh, we have a group working in the film industry. We're looking to expand that statewide next year. Uh, we've got uh, ACOG in Oklahoma City working on uh, talent around uh, battery power and other energy sources in general. And so we're going to open those up uh, for those grants around mid to late April. I don't have a date yet. There's a few other decisions that we need to be, need to make. Um, and once we make those, we'll roll that out. I told a group earlier, we're so excited about this that you will definitely know when these things roll out. And so we look forward to, to seeing what people are working on and, and hopefully being able to partner on that. Um, layoff aversion and incumbent worker training funds. This is something that we need to do more of. Uh, and this is where you really partner with your local workforce area. If there's a change happening within your business and that change requires that employees get retrained, trained up or reskilled, we're definitely your partner for that. We can pay for some of that training um, and also help you get started in that area as part of our mission to uh, reduce the amount of layoffs in the state. And so um, it's kind of a precursor to a rapid response approach. So um, those funds are available and the expertise in those areas are also available. Apprenticeship program development. Um, this is really one of the biggest things going on in the state right now. And so if you haven't heard about our apprenticeship programs, I encourage you to go to our webpage, oklahomaworks.gov, check out what's going on with apprenticeship and see if maybe that solution might be right for you as well. And um, let's see, I think I covered everything, you know, all the other services that we provide that we talk about and labor market data. And so we work uh, closely with the uh, Department of Commerce Research Team and OESC's uh, Labor Market Information Team to provide any level of reporting that you might need to help facilitate the decision-making process uh, in your organization. So uh, please reach out to us for those things as well. One of the, this is one of the big questions that I always get, where does, where does all that money go? Um, and so I wanna give you a graphic that hopefully sticks in your memory. Um, this is the this is the almighty uh, we owe a dollar, and so what you can see obviously in this graphic is that right off the top, 85% of all the workforce money that the state receives goes directly by formula to the local areas. They're the rubber meets the road, boots on the ground, whatever analogy you want to use there. They make it happen. They are your partner 
for any of the stuff that I've talked about or that, that you'll see in these slides uh, later. But um, And then 15% is what is called uh, the governor's discretionary spend, which is a little bit misleading because it's it's only as discretionary as the WIOA Act allows. But I wanted to show you kind of some of the things that we have done in the last year to focus on driving the business side of workforce. Um, sector partnerships I mentioned, that 500,000, we're gonna double that to a million next year. And so we'll either have more sector partnerships or richer investment in individual sector partnerships. So watch for that. Apprenticeship programs. These are incentives that, that we've provided around the growth of apprenticeship programs, as well as staff to help you start a program if you're interested. Business services, we've allotted this, these dollars to the locals for them to uh, uh, staff business service people to actually uh, reach out to you and your communities and help you through some of these benefits that we have. Um, and then finally, here's a slide with just some links, uh, quick links at a state level and, and local level, wherever you are in the state, um, to connect to our benefits and, uh, and uh, take advantage of some of these services. We really look forward to serving the business side as we do job seekers and making a difference with workforce in our state. All right, thank you, Don, appreciate mm -hmm. it. And I know we've uh, began working very closely with you on workforce development, knowing that's gonna be our number one, uh, it's the number one priority for companies uh, looking to come to the state or expand, so excited about the work. All right, let's go over to General Brent Wright to give a legislative update. General? Thanks, Jennifer. Um, appreciate the opportunity to give a short update from last month. So the upcoming session is the second session of the 58th legislature. As uh, Brent mentioned, the session will uh, kick off with the governor's state of the state address in a joint session over in the House chamber uh, next Monday to 7th at noon. Uh, the legislators have filed more than 3,000 bills uh, in joint resolution requests this, this, just this session, almost 250 on the Senate and the rest on the House uh, to be uh, looked at it. And uh, we have 2,500 bills that uh, will carry over from um, 2021 as well. Did want to mention the Senate has had a change in leadership roles, uh, particularly with Kim David stepping down as the Senate floor leader to pursue a statewide office. And uh, her replacement was named Senator Greg McCourtney uh, is the new floor leader. So what, what this means is legislation may be uh, looked at or uh, uh, processed in a little different way. He has uh, stepped up the timeline for committee work and it will actually begin next week. So uh, normally that would take place uh, in about the third week of session. So heads up on that. The House will uh, also actually start committee work. I think the Ag Committee meets uh, next week as well on the House side. So Commerce's uh, priorities uh, remain the same. Uh, is to increase the governor's quick action closing fund. Um, have a significant marketing budget to attract talent and businesses to our state. And of course, our incentive legislation updating that and uh, as well. So we're working with our partners to review uh, almost, well, 60 economic development uh, pieces of legislation. And uh, we'll be looking that over in the, in, the uh, in just the next couple of days. And um, also workforce will probably be a big issue as, uh, uh, we've seen already uh, briefed, and uh, we're going to, I think the legislature is interested in uh, removing barriers in, to reenter the workforce, such as uh, licensing. And um, um, anyway, that's all I have. Um, back to you, Jennifer. All right. Thank you, General Wright. Next, let's go over to community development with Director Votes for an update. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, everyone. I've got a couple of updates on COVID relief programs and then a couple of updates on regular programs. The CDBG COVID relief grant is still available. And fortunately, we have several more years to spend that money. Uh, several, uh, a lot of the, those resources are still unobligated. So if you uh, represent a city, town, or county who has COVID relief needs in the form of services, um, including emergency services, uh, healthcare services, uh, anything that can tie back to COVID relief, please reach out to my office 
and we would love to talk to you ab about navigating that grant. We also have emergency solutions and community services COVID relief grants, but those are ending in September. You've heard me talk about them many times on this call. We will have a big push to spend those dollars through the spring and the summer because they end September 30th. If you uh, are, are a nonprofit or you represent uh, low to moderate income families who need any type of COVID relief emergency services, uh, please reach out to your local community action agency or to my office. And we would love to visit with you on how to best deploy those resources before September. To capitalize on a little bit of what Don talked about, both the CDBG and the CSBG COVID relief can be used for workforce development. So if, if the workforce need can be tied back to a COVID relief factor, such as a person losing their job because of an industry that was particularly impacted by COVID, uh, or for whatever reason, uh, we can pay for some, some upskilling and some retraining uh, for, for that individual if it's tied back to a COVID impact. So again, the CDBG dollars last a long time, several more years, but the CSBG uh, is going to expire at the end of September. On the regular CDBG front, I wanted to let you all know that the 2022 CDBG applications for non-entitlement communities are live on our website at okcommerce.gov under the community development tab. So uh, a lot of you are, are looking at non-COVID related infrastructure projects. Those applications are ready to go. As a little bit of a caveat to that, it shouldn't affect us, but just FYI, there is a federal continuing resolution that expires on February 18th that can affect a lot of federal funding. So mark your calendars for February 18th. At that point, either the government will shut down or there will be an extension or some type of resolution to the federal budget. Either way, we will proceed with processing our 2022 CDBG applications because we will use last year's money first um, without delaying the 2022 allocations. So all in all, there are resources available for both COVID relief as well as general community development and infrastructure. Contact any one of my team or me directly if you have questions about any of it. Jennifer? All right, thank you, Marshall. Next, let's go over to our partners, Kenny Tilly and the Oklahoma Manufacturing Alliance. You wanna give an update on our supply chain initiative. Absolutely, I do wanna mention, uh, as been discussed this morning or in this afternoon as well, that uh, workforce continues to be the number one issue across our state and really across our nation. I wanna remind people about the apprenticeship program that the Manufacturing Alliance has. It will pay up to 24,000 per company in manufacturing for critical occupations such as your CNC or welders. Dr. Sharon Harrison of our staff heads up this uh, program and she can help you launch this program at your company. That's $24,000 per company, $3,000 per employee, and $12,000 per occupation. So I highly encourage you, if you are working with manufacturers in your community, we are glad to come out there and talk to you, talk to your community, and talk to your companies about how to participate and get enrolled in this program. Uh, Brent mentioned, thank you so much, mentioned the OIEP program that's going to be launching in a couple of months, not long from now, and it will be in conjunction with the Finance Authority and our friends at Commerce. We have some outstanding field staff that can be deployed to your manufacturers to help them fill out those applications and uh, potentially secure that funding, so please let us know if we can help with that. I'd like to pitch it now over to our great supply chain manager. Michelle on deck to give us an update on our Connects platform. Thank you so much, Kenny. Yeah, so uh, in Connects, that is the supply chain database provided free to your Oklahoma manufacturers in partnership with the Oklahoma Department of Commerce and the Oklahoma Manufacturing Alliance with funding from uh, OCAST as well. As Jennifer mentioned, we have over 400 companies who have claimed their profile in the Connects platform, and they have over 500 users associated with those accounts in the system. We're still sitting at about 22% of those only have uploaded a capability statement. Now that is 
a better number than some of our other states that are also using this platform, but we're hoping to get that higher because it does benefit the manufacturer to have their capability statement in the system. We're happy to work with companies in your community to help put that together. We have a free template where they can fill in the blank for a lot of the information as well. We're happy to send out. Uh, there are now six states who have partnered to bring a state-specific instance of the Connect Mar Connects Marketplace to their manufacturers. That's Utah, Florida, Kansas, Missouri, Michigan, and Oklahoma. And we were third in that uh, list of states. Um, and we're continuing to work with them as they onboard and really work to bring solutions to manufacturers and connect them with each other across the nation as suppliers. Uh, at the end of 2021, we were recognized by the Connects Marketplace as the leading center out of all of those uh, states for the most exchange center postings. And that is where companies can go in. And we also post from our national MEP network in the exchange center for different needs they have, RFIs, RFQs, things like that, uh, to help connect manufacturers. So we had the we were uh, had the most posts in Q4 2021. It's a good indicator for how many manufacturers are using the system and making connections. Right now in the Exchange Center, there are about 30 open listings that your manufacturers can possibly respond to. Um, a lot of them are from our partners across the nation at our MEP centers, but manufacturers locally as well. Uh, there are a few closings soon. That is a PET plastic sheets, a company looking for metal fabrication, really forming alloy metal plates and a company in Oklahoma looking for a new zinc plater. If you have any manufacturers that can respond to these, please do have them check the platform or get them in touch with us. Additionally, as you know, I do wanna mention they can find uh, information about the OCAST um, grant opportunity that's in there. It is February 2nd now, and that does close on the 4th, but if you have any questions about that for your manufacturers, please connect them with OCAST directly. Uh, for that funding this round or whenever it opens again and how to take advantage of that program. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Okay. Over to Marnie Taylor for an update. Thank you, Jennifer. And thanks everyone for being here. Stay warm. It is snowing at my house. So it, there's a little bit of snow in Oklahoma City branch. Uh, not surprisingly, the number one thing we're talking about the national level and the state level with our nonprofits is workforce. And the number one reason in national polls or uh, surveys is competitive wages, uh, which isn't surprising. So what I really think is happening is the for-profit sector is coming back after a lot of our very talented nonprofit sector employees and doubling down on our salaries, which is unfortunately hard, often hard to do. So it's an issue that we're dealing with as well. Um, our ARPA grant, I think I announced um, that we have actually in kind of partnership with the Department of Commerce moved ahead in the top 50. We have not heard uh, which subcommittee it will be a, a uh, sent to, and I know it's not Health and Human Services because that's meeting next week, but we are looking forward to uh, continuing our work with Commerce and hopefully getting $150 million uh, in grant money to go to the Oklahoma nonprofits. Um, and now that the bills are out uh, to general right, we have about 44 that we are looking at in our sector. Um, a lot of open meetings acts, which you all might be looking at, and some of these we could collaborate on, a lot of tax issues. Raffles, which is an interesting thing for all of you who go to raffles at nonprofits and guns. So um, those probably are similar themes around other sectors, but those are the things that we're looking at right now. We've also started an advocacy roundtable for members of the center. So any of you who are members of the center or would like to become members of the center, we're meeting every other Friday uh, to just to compare notes, what's going on in your subsector, what's going on in our subsector, and um, somewhat like the state chamber has an um, opportunity for for-profit businesses, we're offering that for nonprofit businesses. So if you have interest, please contact me. And our nonprofit council, which I'm excited to say, will meet again soon in February. It's meeting quarterly and it is organized under the Department of Commerce. And I know that um, my team has been working with uh, Director Kissling on actually having workforce be a main subject of that meeting, which is upcoming. So that's all I have today, Jennifer. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you, Marnie. And a couple of notes. Um, a lot of you are asking for the slideshow. We're going to send that out 
uh, here to, to the entire group. So you'll have that um, from Don Morris's presentation. Uh, and yeah, it did. It just started snowing like 10 minutes ago. It's exciting. Uh, throw it over to Brent, Director Kissling for closing remarks. Very good. Well, uh, just to uh, add some further color to some things that General Wright was saying earlier, as we head into the legislative session starting on Monday, if, if your local community has a legislative agenda or has some specific bills that you're tracking, uh, we would love to know about that as well and to have it on our list and, and uh, to make sure that we're keeping an eye on things. So please, uh, please, please, please let General Wright know about that. And the final thing I'll say is uh, many people don't know this, but Jennifer Springer is a huge Cincinnati Bengals fan. And for the first time in most of our lifetime, she is actually happy this time of year. So feel free to wear orange and black as I will be to my uh, Super Bowl party here in another couple of weeks. Everybody have a great time. Stay safe, stay warm, and we'll see you next month.